In this video, I want to talk about two ways that organisms interact within an ecosystem, predation and competition. Within an ecosystem, we have a community, and that's all of the biotic part of the ecosystem, all of the organisms from large to small that make up that ecosystem. Those different organisms can be organized into populations, which are all the members of the same species. Now, species is kind of a floating definition. You do hear a it's used a couple different ways. I think a more accurate definition is that it is an organisms that can breed and produce fertile offspring among themselves. Sometimes you get differentiation because of geographical differences, and you see a, a slight difference between two animals that I would consider the same species, and somebody else calls them two different species. But if they can still interbreed and produce fertile offspring, then I think that makes them a species. There are three major types of community interactions that occur between the different populations in a community, and that is predation, competition, and symbiosis. Today we're just going to talk about predation and competition. Another video will cover symbiosis. So predation is when one species, which we call the predator, consumes the other, the prey and typically the predator hunts down the prey. Predator-prey relationships tend to keep populations in balance. We, they don't stay a straight line. This graph is just sort of a stylized version, um, but you know they don't stay even. Prey populations typically increase, and then they feed in a time lag slightly behind it, an equal increase in the predators. So more prey means more predators can survive. Then the predators eat the prey, and prey populations decrease, which then will lead to a decrease in your predators because they run out of food. And this cycles over and over again. Now, prey don't want to be eaten, of course. They, they have met a number of strategies of adaptations, things that are specific to the those particular organisms that allow them to escape the predators. And we're going to be talking about six of those very quickly. You're probably familiar with many of these adaptations just because you know how the animal world works. But prey use poisons and mimicry. They have ways to deceive the predators so they can't be seen. They have chemical defenses or they have offensive weapons on their own bodies and also use camouflage so that they won't be eaten. Poisonous organisms often have bright colors that warn the predators away to say, you know, don't eat me, as we see in the many of the rainforest frogs that are brightly colored. Those poisons are developed from the food that they eat, which is why these, food, these frogs can be used as pets. If they're not fed the particular organisms that would make them poisonous, then they're just pretty and not poisonous. But in the natural environment, they are not good to eat, and they're sending up warning signs by their colors. In mimicry, one species resembles another. So a particular type of mimicry, Batesian mimicry, you have a harmless species that resembles a poisonous or an unpalatable, a not very tasty species. The picture I have here of a viceroy butterfly, um, evidently these butterflies taste better than the monarch butterfly that they greatly resemble. And so by looking like a undelicious, a, a not very tasty um, insect, they avoid being eaten perhaps by a predator that is wanting to dine on a butterfly. You also see this with some flies that resemble poison or stinging insects. They resemble a wasp or a bee. The fly does not sting, but it looks enough like the stinging insect that that also may allow that species to survive. Another type of prey defense is visual deception, things that are markings on the animal itself that deceive the predators and give the prey a minute to escape away. So you might be aware of some of the eye markings that are on fish or on caterpillars that are saying, you know, this is where the, the head of the animal is and it's really the tail ends. We have a fish down here with a very large eye marking. And then there are also eye markings that will make the predator perhaps think that they're looking at a different animal altogether. This is a moth, but it looks very much like an owl when you're looking at those eye markings on the lower part of the wings. Another type of, predator, of prey defense is to have something chemical, something that smells horrible or can be harmful to the predator. And so we you know, are familiar with the skunk with a very awful smell. And then this is a bombardier beetle who actually puts out acid in defense. 
And the last category, last two categories, we have offensive weapons, so that prey are not coming, you know, completely defenseless. They might have things like antlers or their teeth or claws or quills, like this porcupine down here, which allow them to provide some way to fight back when the predator gets at them. The last category is camouflage, which is also called cryptic coloring, and it gives the prey a way to hide in the environment. Many, many insects use camouflage. They look look, look like the plants they live on. And we see a stick insect here um, hanging on the stick, and if it's not moving, it's just going to look like part of the tree. Baby animals, we have a baby seal here blending in with the snowy environment. You might be familiar with baby deer fawns having a spotted coat so they can kind of hide under the trees. And so this allows them to escape detection because they can't be seen. On the other side, the predators have a variety of adaptations that give them a better chance to catch their prey. They don't have to rely just on chasing them down. And so I want to talk about concealment, tool youth, stealth, lures, and traps that predators use. So concealment is very similar to camouflage in that the predators are or the, the camouflage category in the prey because this is the camouflage used by predators that conceal them while they hunt. So we have a fish over here that looks very much like a sponge sitting there looking or sitting there among the sponges waiting for dinner to swim by. And of course, you're familiar with the stripes on a tiger, which allows it to hide in grass because the coat blends in very nicely with the environment. Certain types of predators use tools. Primates are very um, well known for using sticks to go kind of collect a tasty snack of insects such as ants or termites. If you're familiar with how those insects behave, if you poke a stick in their nest, they will swarm out and up the stick and then the um, in this case a chimpanzee can pick up the stick and just lick the insects off. Sea otters also use rocks balanced on their bellies to break open the shells, the shellfish that they're having to eat. Stealth is when you have ambush predators that practice a wait and see status, stat, strategy or sneak up on their prey and then have a quick surprise attack. So praying mantis will sit motionless or creep slowly towards the insect until they're ready to reach out and grab it. Crocodiles and alligators can submerge themselves in the water so they look basically like a floating log until they can get close enough to their dinner. Lures are another thing that predators use to attract the prey within striking range. So you're probably familiar with the angler fish that lives way down deep in the ocean and has you know a little um, dangly bit that is going to look like something edible by something really that the anglerfish itself is going to eat. Snakes also exhibit this. Here we have a particular type of viper that the end of its tail really looks more like a spider. And so it will dangle the uh, little bit of spider, you know, a little bit of tail out there, trying to attract a small mammal that might want to eat that spider. And then instead the snake will eat it. And the last category is traps. You're very familiar with spiders and other species of insects that create webs to trap other insects. And so here we have a funnel web, much more extensive than kind of the spider webs that we're uh, comfortable with seeing all over the place. And then some of the mammals in the ocean, both dolphins and humpback whales, will make bubble nets to catch fish or krill. So this is a humpback, two humpback whales making a bubble net to trap krill here in the center. And then they come up with their mouths wide open. You can see the whale body right here with its flippers out and just kind of take a mouthful of their dinner. So these are all ways that predators and prey, you know, try to escape being eaten, but, but predation is one of the main ways that energy is going to flow through an ecosystem. And then the last category I want to just talk, I just want to mention really competition, which occurs when two species or two members of the same species go after the same resources. Now this can be the food or water supply, but also space is a resource that can, uh, there can be competition because animals have territories. They have a certain amount of space that they need, either it's if a nesting, um, ground nesting birds such as penguins, you know, they kind of have a certain amount of of meter square meter space around them that they need to build their nest or we had in the class activity we talked about how the coral reef the corals need a certain amount of space and algae can crowd them out by competition
You're probably familiar with the many ways that male birds compete for the females by their bright plumage or their particular colorful singing, or some of them have little dance motions to attract the females. And in a particular ecosystem, you might have, at least temporarily, two different predator species that are trying to compete for the same prey. Depending upon the number of prey, they may successfully be able to coexist, or one species might not be able to, to survive. And then I just mentioned our algae and the coral. So competition, is certainly in the extreme state, can lead to extinction, where the animal species cannot survive, at least in that area, because of the lack of the resources. Or over time, species can specialize, that small genetic differences will favor a certain path in adaptation, and that specialization then allows the species to occupy a different niche, a different um, part in the ecosystem. The niche can be determined by what food they eat in particular or when they eat, and that will allow these two species that are very, very similar to coexist because they're not really competing anymore. The classic example of specialization is what happens with bird beaks. I mean, birds have beaks, but beaks come in very different shapes. And so these shapes are linked to what the bird eats, and that allows these different kinds of birds to all live in the same place. And if you've had a bird feeder, you know you can see a variety of birds, and some birds like seeds, and some birds like fruits, and some birds like suet. And so they are all living in the same area. They are all part of the same community, but they specialize in what they eat. So just for example, red-tailed hawk have strong hooked beaks because they are flesh eaters where cardinals have these very cone-shaped and very tough thick beaks because they crack open seeds. Birds that go fishing that have to get their dinner from the water might have long flat bills or pelicans have this big scoop. Um, and of course, your great blue herrings can basically spear their dinner with their long, skinny, very pointed beaks. Insects that dig, the are not birds that dig insects out of the ground or out of the wood have a different shape of the beak. And so these specializations allow these birds to avoid competition to that each bird species has its own niche in the ecosystem and then that allows everybody to survive. So Competition and predation, two types of interactions that occur between different species, different organisms within one ecosystem.